All right. All right. I'm recording and I'm opening chat and I am turning on PowerPoint. All right. Welcome to day seven. And the mystery photo today was taken by me, not Matthew, so I actually know the answer. So here is the question. All of these red trees that I said, what killed these baby trees? They're actually only mostly dead. A lot of them actually came back in 2018. But in 2017, I thought they were really dead. Um, so what killed these baby trees? And hint, it is related to snow. This is Tuolumne Meadows in the Sierra Nevada, photo taken in summer 2017. Any ideas? It was a monster snowpack in 2017. Ava's right, but it, it wasn't water. This meadow floods uh, every summer and water doesn't kill the baby trees. It was, it was related to monster snowpack, but there's something else. Interception, They were these trees were under the snowpack. I mean, I guess you could kind of call it interception, but I think it was burial. Um, monster snowpack was definitely above these trees by quite a bit. Ice, yeah. It actually, um, both Cassie and Steven said ice. And what happened in 2017 was there was a monster snowpack. It was really cold. And then there was a giant rain on snow event. And there was so much snow that actually froze all the rain in the snowpack. And so there was this giant layer of ice in the bottom of the snowpack in the meadow. And it killed or semi-killed a bunch of trees. And you could see these trees like in a bathtub ring all around the whole meadow in various spots around the park. Um, and I still have to ask Matthew for the answer to his. All right, so moving on to logistics. We are on Wednesday, October 24th in the very final stretch. Um, note that homework two, I switched it's due Friday at midnight Eastern time. Um, we switched order. We did some calibration evaluation last time, and today we'll be talking about distributing snow models. Before I get into that, we've got, per usual, some logistics. Um, first, for homework two, if people need me to post CSV files or NetCDF files, or if you're having trouble, let me know. I think this one you can actually do all the plotting in the IPython notebook, but if you can't, let me know um, ASAP and I'll try to get something out by tomorrow. Um, and then for Monday, we have both reflections. That's just give me some feedback on how we can make this class even better. Shouldn't take you long, just remember to do it. And you guys will be given some presentations. So with regards to the presentations, I was able to find the first three groups were listed somewhere in Canvas. The people I put in groups four, five, and six, I could not figure out if you had formed your own group at all. So I gave you a group. If anybody would like to change, please post something on Canvas. If not, um, if you have plans and I'm just not aware of them, please post something in the discussion board, send me an email. Um, otherwise, these are your groups. Um, I assign them for you. Okay. Plan of action for Monday. Um, each group will present for about eight minutes with two minutes time for questions. Um, I believe you all should be able to share your screen, but I'm not quite sure. So I would recommend that um, you send me your PowerPoint or PDF or whatever you want to show ahead of time and let me know which group member would like to share his or her screen. Um, and we'll have a backup plan that I can share my screen if it's not working. Um, there is a rubric posted on the assignments on Canvas, and you will be responsible for evaluating each other's presentations by filling out the rubric. Um, it will come in the form of quizzes on Canvas. Um, it helps me process the numbers. Uh, and the participation in evaluating each other will count towards your participation grade for the class. Um, I know some people have trouble showing up um, during class time. So if you have some time constraints where you need to run at the end of class or you'll be a bit late at the beginning of class on Monday, it's pretty important to let me know. So um, I will make sure your presentation is earlier or later 
if you do have to miss one other group's presentation, um, you can watch the recording and then fill out, um, you, you can still fill out the quiz online later, but it would be better if you're here to watch the questions, if ans ask questions, if at all possible. Any, any questions on the logistics for Monday? I don't see anyone frantically typing that the groups I put you in are wrong or anything else. You can also unmute yourself and talk if you have a question. Question on homework two? Yes, you can ask a question on homework two. And you can talk if it's easier than typing. I think you just have to click the little uh, microphone button. Okay. So, um, Joran says, for the observed scenario in homework two, do we use scaled wind or original wind from the observation? I would recommend that you use scaled wind um, because the scaled wind is scaling the observations. It, it is the observed scenario, and that's the one that is in the example. Um, so you, the, the first one was an example just showing you had to scale the wind, but the proper approach is scaling the wind. Then leave that wind scaled, don't change it anymore. Um, for homework two, only change the long way. Is that, is that clear? Okay. And it looks like we actually have, um, so we have Frederick, Michelle, and Stephen are together, and Ben, Ava, and Josh are together. That leaves Jonathan without a group. Is that correct? Jonathan on. Looks like so we have five groups of three and one group of one. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, I would rather, I mean, Jonathan, do you want to be in a group by yourself? If not, maybe one of the groups of three, if you haven't already done a lot of work, might include Jonathan. Um, or Jonathan will have his own project. Um, All right. <laughs> there you go. Okay, Jonathan can join whichever other group he wants. We'll have one group of four, so that Jonathan isn't tortured for eight minutes, and um, that will that will work. Okay. So um, you've got lots of invites there, and I'll let you figure out um, which one you're joining, Jonathan, and then just post on the discussion board so everybody knows where you are. Okay. All right. So. Um, with that, um, we will have time also for me to have about eight, 10 minutes to share one cool thing as well. So if anyone has any requests, things I did not have time to go over at all are rain versus snow, snow compaction and density formulations, model numerics, time stepping and order of operations. Um, on homework one, why the surface temperature in the thick top layer model actually got above zero degrees C, uh, the answer to all the puzzle photos, or um, many other things. So I will take requests, again, post on the discussion board, or uh, type them, communicate them in some fashion that I can receive, um, if you have any requests among these. Um, <laughs> I think Justin has some, some requests. All right. And I will email Matthew and ask if he will give his answers. All right. <laughs> Okay, so um, I'm still not done grading homework one. Um, I mean, the one revenge students have against teachers, if a teacher gives too hard a homework, teacher also has to spend too much time grading it. Um, it's pretty involved, so I'm still working through that. I'm done with the grading on the PILPS paper assignment. Um, the, the answers were, most people got it. Um, most people got two and three perfectly. Um, but number one, some people um, some people missed that the incoming long wave, just like we're doing in homework two for this entire experiment, was estimated, not measured. Part of the problem, if the prescribed long wave was incorrect, any models that compensated for this error with some other error would look like the best performing compared to the actual snow observations on the ground. So this is a case 
if we're about if we're not just comparing the models to each other, but we were trying to find which one matched snow observations on the ground. If we had given them all the wrong forcing, then the one with the air in the exact opposite direction would look the best for the wrong reasons, with two wrongs making a right. Um, the other one people had a lot of different answers on were number four, um, where the net radiation, which is incoming minus outgoing short wave plus incoming minus outgoing long wave is negative. So the snow surface, which is also called the ground surface in some models, that was a bit confusing in that because these are climate models, sometimes the snow is actually integrated into the ground surface instead of a separate layer. But it cools, becomes a very stable layer with the surface cooler than the air temperature. So the turbulent fluxes, which are sensible and latent heat flux, where latent heat is the energy that causes sublimation, shuts off then the warm air sitting above the snowpack can't warm the snow surface. And then continuing long wave heat loss, negative net radiation cools the surface further. The long wave heat loss doesn't actually go up because that's epsilon sigma t to the fourth. And as t goes down, the long wave heat loss goes down slightly, but it just keeps going and it just can't finish the cycle. So it just continues with heat loss, even though it's a little bit less each day as the surface cools. Um, thinking of this, um, I wanted to just go back. I realized that when I did um, turbulent heat flux, I jumped into complicated things so quickly that I may have not completely gone over the, the simpler things. So um, here is a graphic from a, a review paper by Fayette et al. on snow hydrology in Mediterranean regions, where they have a nice picture and have identified all of the different parts in here, um, including you know, incoming, outgoing, solar radiation, long wave radiation, sensible and latent heat fluxes, a snowpack with snow albedo, energy for melt, and um, losses to sublimation and to melt. And I am going to attempt to do a poll. We will see if this actually works. Okay, so launch the poll. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna see if I can, I don't know if you can see my screen or if you can only see the poll. Let me see. Uh, you see the poll. You see the, okay, well, if you can remember what my screen looked like, <laughs> I can see my screen. Um, so the question is, which, which elements shown here in this picture make up this net radiation balance? If you can figure out how to vote in the poll. What is it? Yeah, that's energy from HM is energy from melt. Yeah. Yeah, so SWI is short wave in, SWO is short wave out. LWI is long wave in. So this is the net radiation balance. And 59% of you have voted. Can you see how other people vote or no? Should we just answer? What is the net radiation balance? Does anyone else want to vote? It's like 88% of you have voted. You can just guess. It doesn't say who voted for what. It's not graded as far as I can tell. All right. I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll. And you see the picture again? All right. All right, so we had 31% of you voted for the net radiation balance is short wave in minus short wave out plus long wave in minus long wave out. That is correct. However, 38% of you were even more correct in that you voted that both one and two were correct because 
you can also show um, shortwave out is shortwave in times snow albedo. So shortwave in times one minus snow albedo is just another way of writing that. Um, nobody voted for that by itself, but 38% voted both one and two are correct. That's the most correct answer. And then um, a few people voted, including other terms such as the sensible and latent heat flux. So that is, those are included in the net surface energy balance, but the net radiation balance is only shortwave and longwave radiation. And I just put that in because I realized I hadn't been, um, we hadn't been super clear on that. So let's, um, let's go for one more poll. All right. The question is, how do you calculate snow density? Does it not show up? Yeah. Hmm. Is that what Chat. Okay. Can you sit now? People are voting. You just aren't getting it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it won't let me take the poll. Okay. <laughs> All right, last, last call to vote. Like most people voted. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll. Go back to um, our question here. So, um, so what are the units of snow density? Of any kind of density, yeah, kilograms per meter cubed, right? So, um, so we we know that that is by definition of any density total weight divided by total volume, right? So number three was correct. So now when we're looking at snow depth and snow water equivalent, total weight is snow water equivalent divided by, and that snow water equivalent is typically defined as weight per unit area. And then snow depth is height. And so if we do snow water equivalent divided by snow depth, we get total weight divided by total volume. That can either be reported as kilograms per meter cubed or as a percentage number. So 50% of you who wrote that both two and three were correct um, are absolutely right. 25% um, are um, correct who wrote snow water equivalent divided by snow um, depth and 6% who wrote total weight divided by total volume are correct. Yeah, I think remembering the units, is it mass? Just don't say weight. <laughs> okay. Weight, mass, sorry, I mean weight doesn't equal mass. Doesn't it on earth? I thought it was always if you were on earth. Weight is mass. I wasn't a physics major. Okay, so if you voted for one because you didn't like my wording, you give yourself all the credit back. Um, all right, mass divided by volume. Okay. All right. And last quiz. Again, just to make sure we're all on the same page. Loss of snow by sublimation is calculated from which energy flux term? The choices are net radiation, the net energy balance, sensible heat flux, latent heat flux, or ground heat flux.
Last call for votes. All right, I'm gonna close the poll. So 67% of you have the right answer with latent heat flux. Um, there was also some small percentage who picked net radiation, the net energy balance, and sensible heat flux. So let's um, so let, let's go into you know exactly what what is sublimation by definition. Um, because I, I think most, but not everyone has it. So let's do, can everybody see my screen with a, a rabbit with a hairdryer? Yeah, I'm trying to put my chat back open um, instead of my polls. Okay, I'm going to close polls. All right. All right, okay. So, um, all right. So here is just a bit more on turbulence, and uh, this is sensible heat flux, right? It's the rabbit with a hairdryer coming after the poor snowman whose uh, wife says, it's not worth it, just give him our noses and let him go. All right, so, um, so um, turbulent energy flux depends on what? And here we're, we're not doing any quizzes, just to type a few ideas of we went over this um, in general, but I think we went really fast and got really complicated really fast. So I just want to reach out to everybody who's comfortable with turbulent energy flux. Yeah, so Justin wrote wind, vapor pressure, surface temperature. Wind is absolutely right. There's something about vapor pressure and surface temperature. Gradient, right. Stephen added air temperature gradient and vapor pressure gradient. Um, so we we can think about um, sensible heat working like a hair dryer, right? That we've got wind, we've got warm temperature, we've got a gradient over the snow. Um, latent heat is by definition the um, the energy of changing phase. So latent heat you know, it, it's latent because it's, you know, stored in the droplets themselves. Um, and so latent heat flux is the energy flux associated with changing phase. And then sublimation or condensation are the variables we use to keep track of the mass associated with that change of phase. Because we are, in the case of latent heat flux, say only energy flux aside from melt flux, that actually you know, makes us lose mass. So um, it's also important to consider that, that latent heat um, can either cool the surface or warm the surface. We saw that in our model runs. So sublimation is a loss of, um, it's a loss of mass from the snow to the surface. You're getting ice changing into um, water vapor, and that cools the surface. It takes a lot of energy to sublimate the ice. Um, what I'm showing here in this picture is actually, um, I, I grew up in the Central Valley of California, and they would frequently, on the coldest nights of the winter, run sprinklers. And I was always kind of confused, like, okay, generally the cold nights in the winter, like what plants don't want to transpire, why are you watering all your crops? They would water the crops, particularly all the vineyards, the high value crops, so that ice would freeze on the crops because, you know, condensation or process of freezing warms the surface. So actually by letting ice freeze on the surface in this picture, you would actually protect the crops. And so it was um, trying to um, cause freezing to occur to save the crops. Um, Similarly, in a rain on snow event, you know, if rain doesn't melt the snow, what does? A condensation on the surface can melt the snow. So that's a just key concept to keep in the back. Um, here, I've, I've just written it for you. Latent heat is the energy of the phase change. Sublimation is associated with the mass change. And then um, this is more, I won't go over this again, but just you know, for your reference, what is latent heat? Um, you know, water vapor pressure increases with height, water vapor is condensed on the snow, 
and energy is released to the snow as vapor pressure decreases with height, water vapor is sublimated from the snow, and um, energy is lost from the snow. Another thing that's just interesting to think about here, um, this is a, um, a sketch I borrowed from the website right here, um, is we think about, you need to think about the triple point of water, that when we have ice, it can actually go either into the vapor phase via sublimation, or it can go into the liquid phase via melt. Um, if you just look up the numbers, the latent heat of sublimation from solid to a vapor is roughly 2.8 times 10 to the six joules per kilogram at zero C. And the latent heat of melt going from a solid to a liquid is in order of magnitude less. 3.3, um, roughly, times 10 to the fifth joules per kilogram at zero degrees C. So there's, there's been a mystery, a lot of papers talking about what has been melting the glaciers on Mount Kilimanjaro, because basically there has been no recorded temperature increase on the top of Kilimanjaro, and yet the glaciers seem to be disappearing. So um, one hypothesis, and I posted a couple of papers if you're interested on this, is that you know, sublimation is an order of magnitude larger in energy than melt. Sublimation cools the snow surface. An increase in humidity has been recorded near Mount Kilimanjaro, and it switches from sublimation to melt. So what might be the consequence for the remaining snow? And it's still somewhat debated because people say, well, sublimation also makes you lose snow. But um, by just increasing the humidity and having more loss in the melt phase, less energy can actually melt more of the glacier. So it's kind of an interesting just thought process about sublimation. Any, any questions on turbulence and sublimation? Because I felt I hadn't covered them so well before. All right. The other thing just from the evaluation that I wanted to go over um, in the supplemental reading is, um, is Richard Ezery's 2013 paper on 1701 snow models. It's really similar to the SUMA model we're using. It's a single model, Jim, which he has since renamed. It's called the fractional snow model now. Anyway, it has multiple names, but it's Richard Ezery's model. And he ran it with several options for each process to isolate the model choices. Um, he said there was no best model, but came up with, at the end of this paper, that some choices were better than others. And some rules of thumb he gave were that um, better choices include models with a prognostic representations of snow albedo and density that had some representation of liquid water storage and refreezing in the snow, and that did not use a turbulent flux that decouples the surface from the atmosphere. I think we found similar um, answers in most of what we've done in this class. Um, we talked about, again, last time we talked about metrics, and he has this weight in how well you got root mean squared error between ma matching observed snow water equivalent, observed snow depth, observed snow albedo, and observed snow surface temperature. And then he came up with this matrix here. So here in the upper left-hand corner is just how well different things fit each of his four metrics. And then the big one in the lower right-hand corner is how well um, different choice schemes for the choices on the bottom matched all of them weighted together. Um, it's kind of complicated paper because, you know, white, gray, and dark gray represent option two, one, and zero, which you have to go reference. So I will go ahead and do that for you and just give you, again, as you're choosing things in SUMA or looking at models you might use in the future, this is a good reference to have. So the, the first thing he found is that for compaction, overall physical snow compaction worked best, assuming no compaction or constant compaction were not as good. All of the best models chose a physical snow compaction scheme. And here's an example of the equation. Um, the white was assuming a constant new snow density um, it was not so good. It didn't appear in the best models very often, but the other parameterizations both worked about equally well. A temperature-based snow albedo was not good. 
but either a physical based on snow grain size or an empirical mechanism, which was what we looked at with the time decay worked about equally well. Um, the um, Mononobokov length parameterization was not good. It didn't appear in any of the best models. The white one was a constant exchange coefficient with no stability correction. And just setting that was most commonly in the best models, which shows us how good we're doing with stability corrections. There was no clear best solution for either snow cover fraction or thermal conductivity parameterizations. Um, they didn't seem to make a big difference in how frequently a model appeared in the, um, in, in the best category. And then in terms of hydrology, which is liquid water percolation through snow, ignoring water storage was never a good option. However, um, a higher water holding capacity parameterization worked better more often than not. It actually was pretty overwhelmingly better. All right. All right, now I'm going to switch to distributing models. And we won't be doing this. What I'm going for any of our homework, so this is more for your future reference. I'm going to start by walking you through an example um, from Glenn Liston. Um, this there, and then I will go through um, some slides about multiple options for distributing. So I'm going to just go through one set of options. Basically, Glenn did not go for a modular modeling approach. He went for just making the solutions he thought were the best, but making an integrated system that worked well together. Um, so this is um, his presentation that he gave at the Snow Modeling School in 2014 that I wanted to share. So, um, you know, his goal is really, you know, to be able to simulate snow evolution anywhere in the world at relevant and realistic spatial resolutions, which is probably what most of us would like, um, which can be used for applications for many ecological processes, um, including um, probably the most charismatic, you know, snow drifts for baby polar bears. Um, Glenn's run his model over all of Colorado and over most of large portions of the Northern Hemisphere. Um, he has a set of models that he puts together, um, which I'll, I'll walk you through. Again, this is sort of how to distribute in one set of choices. Um, Micromet is distributing the meteorology. Snow model is similar to SUMA, what we've been doing. And then snow is sim is a way to take observations and assimilate them into snow model, which is beyond the scope of what we can get to in this course. So um, the variables are the same ones we've been using already. Um, you know, the optical, thermal, and mechanical properties of snow. Um, one thing, again, with the distributed model that comes into play that we have not seen in SUMA is blowing snow. You can move snow from one grid cell to another. And um, you can look at spatial patterns of when snow is free. So how, you know, how do we get this set up? Um, you know, one thing is to start with global ocean land atmosphere models and reanalysis, right? We talked about your MET forcing and particularly if you want something to apply over the entire Arctic or Antarctic snow of the globe, um, you're going to need to start with a global precipitation data set. Most of these are two coarse, and so regional climate models typically are running at a higher resolution. When I talked about the forcing data, I recommended using WARF, which is the weather research forecasting model, which is just an example of one type of a regional climate model that you could use. All right, Glenn then takes this data. So again, you know, a, a typical regional model might run at you know, five kilometers, for example. Um, that's pretty high for an atmospheric model. And then snow, we typically want to represent at a finer resolution than five kilometers. So Micromet is basically an interpolation scheme that can either interpolate data from your weather model or data from an array of weather stations. So here's a picture of a weather station 
and then on a grid where you could find a lot of weather stations and then interpolates that data everywhere onto a regular grid. Once you have distributed that, you can um, run it into the MELT model, which is similar to what we've done in SUMA, which again, you have a choice um, question. Um, you, have, you have a choice of a single layer model or a multi-layer model. Um, he has a snow transfer 3D model, which will move snow um, through saltation and turbulent suspension from one location and deposit it in another location. And then um, I won't go into the data simulation model that's beyond our class. So one way to think about this is having a nested grid modeling system, starting with your global model or reanalysis is generally the boundary conditions for a regional model or reanalysis. This can then be downscaled using in a statistical scheme, such as Micromet. There are multiple other ones you could choose, but that's typically the way to go. Then run a um, snow model, other aspects of hydrology, and then look at impacts and uh, ecosystem or social models of what that does. So, um, the goals are, you know, basically take the mathematical descriptions that we know about snow. We've done that in this class quite a bit. Take the basic meteorological variables. We've talked about that a little bit. And then think about um, what it, can we learn from high resolution topography and land cover vegetation data that should inform how we're distributing this across our landscape. So the model is able to add information to simply basic meteorological inputs by using physics of how we expect things to be distributed in space and time. So here are some examples. So um, this is Glenn's subroutine for um, using air temperature and precipitation to get snowfall, um, where he just has a temperature threshold that says if it's colder than some temperature threshold, you can get snowfall. Um, Depending on what you're using, if you um, just have weather stations that report temperature and precip and nothing else, which is what most do, you need the model to use something physical basis on a temperature threshold. Um, rain versus snow, the two degrees C temperature threshold um, is subjective. And um, if we have time on Monday, I can talk a little bit more about that. Um, then we know in topography, um, the energy balance, right? The solar radiation, we actually are really good at geometrically modeling solar radiation, potential solar radiation in space and time. So we know that snow is going to melt faster on south facing slopes because they have more potential solar radiation. So when we are distributing our snow model, we distribute our solar radiation according to the geometry of the landscape so that we get more snow melt on south-facing slopes and less snow melt on north-facing or shaded slopes. And these are just an example of the equations that go into how snow model calculates shading on topographic slopes. Then what sets um, Glenn Liston's model apart for many used in the lower 48 of the US um, is, is that he includes snow transport. Basically, when you go to the Arctic, Pretty obvious that the snow is blowing around most of the time, as shown from the pictures. It can blow around through the process of saltation, which is basically um, individual snow grains getting picked up and deposited further down, as well as by turbulent suspension, which um, is snow grains getting embedded in the storm and lifted up, as shown in the picture on the right. Um, here's a picture of Glenn with saltation happening right in front of him, as well as a um, very high resolution photograph taken by Kobayashi in 1972 studying saltation. Um, it's basically happening, you know, moving the snow along the surface very close to the surface without getting too high up. Um, so you can directly study the physics of saltation and suspension as a function of wind shear velocity and then model you know, when that snow is going to pick up and move. You can then use 
physics of the terrain to know that snow is going to erode where wind speeds are accelerating. So that's on the windward side of a drift shown here. And um, that snow is going to accumulate in locations where wind speeds are reduced. So basically in the lee of something that blocks the prominent wind direction. And you can see that walking around complex terrain um, in any windy environment. So, um, so basically the model takes into account, um, you know, how much would be eroded from each, how is the, the wind speed changing, right? So where is wind speed increasing versus decreasing? And then can calculate, uses that difference in wind acceleration to calculate how much snow is going to be lifted up. You see these are just differences along the gradient in the red here. And then the, how much is going to be deposited at each location moving down. So this is how the um, wind transport model works. Um, this is happening um, at multiple scales. So these are drifts behind individual shrubs out on the plains of Colorado. These are drifts behind uh, lines of trees in Libby Flats, Wyoming. These are drifts behind the mountains in, um, in more complex topography. Um, so again, this is something we see, it's something when we're distributing a snow model that we can use our understanding of the physics to represent. Now, running this kind of model where you are picking up snow and redistributing it is computationally expensive. So one thing is important to consider when you are distributing a snow model is what is the domain you want to run over? What are the processes you want to represent? And um, you know, how, how fine of a grid do you actually want? So um, I will show you in, um, in the next module different architecture for distributing your snow model. But for this one, which is called snow model, just for confusion. Um, it's a rectangular grid. So you've got NX by NY points. Um, okay, these points are going to evolve in time, right? So your model is going to simulate at each of these points at every point in time, you're going to get a pretty large grid of data fairly quickly. So when you are looking out at the landscape you want to model and you are dividing it into grid cells, you need to think about how fine of a grid cell do I need to represent these processes, right? To get these, you get this solar radiation effect shown here of the sunny south facing slopes, you actually need a fairly high resolution um, grid. Um, but you can also see very quickly that you're going, your computational cost is going to go up very quickly. Similarly, to represent blowing snow over a drift, you want a pretty high resolution grid. This one. Now, if you want to run over the entire state of Colorado, your computer is likely to crash if you're trying to run the entire state of Colorado at the size of individual snow drifts. So Glenn recommends not trying to model blowing snow everywhere at once in Colorado. My computer is slowing down. Just wants to make sure you all are very convinced about not doing blowing snow in Colorado. There, yeah. That's why it slows down your computer when you make that grid cell. Now, you could choose different grid cells in different domains, right? So um, here is showing, okay, if we want to do a snow simulation over the um, continental US, um, we might want a finer grid spacing in the mountains of the Western US than we want on the Great Plains of the Northeastern US um, in order to represent orographic precipitation and storm gradients over steep terrain. So again, we need to think about our scales and probably only some areas of particular interest for studies would we go down to the finest scale of, you know, five meters in places. 
another decision in addition to how you spatially discretize your landscape is how, what time step do you need? So this is just a um, picture of daily, the dark green and hourly light green time steps of air temperature. And you can see here in March that if you're doing hourly, you get above zero degrees C in M March and in early April. Whereas if you are doing daily averages, you don't get above zero degrees C until late April or early May. And so whether you simulate melt will be different depending on your time step. Most people agree that you need an hourly time step um, to simulate melt. Three hourly is probably okay, but daily is not a good idea. So here is just a picture of what the model says in terms of um, April 1st SWE and when it starts melting um, after data assimilation. So um, this was um, where the blue are, um, so the first the difference is in terms of the light green and the dark green. This is the difference between a daily and an hourly time step. So you can see that when you go to a daily time step, you keep snow longer because you didn't get warm enough early in the season. And then the other thing you can see here is that what the data assimilation does is it says that precipitation was probably wrong. And so it reruns the model with an observation that says there's actually more snow about this date saying that um, we're going to correct for precipitation by about 75%. And I think, okay, so the, the blue is without data assimilation, the green is with data assimilation. So there was less precipitation than we thought, so we corrected it down. Again, we're not totally going into data assimilation, but it's something to think about when you're distributing a model in places where you might not have a good measurement of precipitation, but you might have some measurement of depth from a snow course or a LIDAR survey near Peak Swede that you could then update the model. So it's also important to get a time step that can represent blowing snow because it's threshold dependent. You need wind speed above five meters per second and time dependent. Um, the wind speed here is the threshold, but again, hourly, it's going to go above that threshold. It's going to cause some blowing snow. Daily averages don't go above that average. So in one case, you would get blowing snow. In the other case, you would not get blowing snow, similar to the melt. Um, here is a, a good slide in case you are going um, and investigating cloud computing. Um, they always ask me when I talk to um, Amazon Cloud, they say exactly how much CPU time do you need? I never know. Um, but Glenn has calculated out, you know, your CPU time in hours is a function of number of grid cells in the X direction, number of grid cells in the Y direction, times number of grid cells in time. Um, so, you know, 1,000 by 1,000 for one year might take one hour of computer time and moving up to more years, you know, et cetera. You can figure out how it scales. Um, other scaling information to think about is that, you know, computationally, if we are trying to run something for many years for a climate type simulation or over a large domain, um, we are going to necessarily be going to larger grid elements. And so how do we deal with the loss of information that happens just as we scale up. So one option there is to use subgrid parameterizations. And I'm going to show you a little bit more about these in the next module as well. Um, so one way to do this is you, know, you go to the mountains, and over this domain, the actual snow distribution is quite variable. So what you see is a picture of the snow. And a statistical snow distribution is just a histogram of what fraction of the area is at each um, snow depth. For the prairie, the snow is much more constant. And so you can see that too, as there's less variance in the prairie. And so people have developed what's called a snow covered depletion curve that says, you know, when the snow drops below some threshold amount, how quickly does the total area of snow drop down to zero? And you can, I think you can conceptualize here that for the prairie where your snow depth is all quite similar,
similar that once you drop below a certain threshold, you know, basically snow is going to disappear everywhere at once. Whereas in the mountains, it's going to be a much more gradual process as some of this snow will, this, you know, shallower snow is going to disappear earlier, the deeper snow is going to disappear later. And so you can parameterize this relationship in what's called a depletion curve. You can define these different depletion curves by looking at different geographic regions and looking at the coefficient of variation. And remember, we talked about last time the coefficient of variation is um, the standard deviation divided by the mean. Um, that's correct, yes. Um, and then that can be related to the subgrid snow distribution. For example, places with a um, very high coefficient of variation, the um, snow is quite variable. And you can see that that happens in areas of complex terrain, whereas again, when you get out into the prairies, it's much lower. And if you have no snow, it's almost non-existent. Um, you can then define distribution functions for an area and then come up with a good guess of how your snow might deplete spatially. Another option is to have predefined distribution patterns. Um, for example, you could say um, any snow that is blown around accumulates in a predefined pattern. So instead of individually tracking snow grains that are moving from one spot to the next, you can say, you know, here is, so here in the bottom left is a picture of Imnaviat Creek in Alaska. And you can see that, you know, over here on the left, you get fairly deep piles of snow with the four in the red. And um, over here in the mid right, you've got much smaller piles of snow. And so you could say, all right, this is my pattern. It's repeatable from year to year. And therefore, I'm going to allocate my snow distribution by this predefined pattern. Um, so let's look at this um, with three different model runs. So this is Glenn's polar bear maternity den simulations. Um, he is running this model at two and a half meters with a time step of one day over a 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer domain. And this is on the um, north bank of Alaska, fairly close to Prudhoe Bay where they're doing a lot of oil drilling. And they wanna tell people doing oil drilling not to go disturb baby polar bears. So here's the predominant wind direction from the left. Um, here you can see in the picture where the snow drifts are. Um, polar bears need, a, um, need snow of a certain depth so that they can fit inside it. And so they go to drifts, which are the deepest snow piles in the region. And that's where they make polar bear dens. So here is the field team. Here's Glenn in the blue in the middle. Um, I don't actually know the rest of the field team. Um, here is the den with a polar bear inside it. Here's what it looks like in the summer. Again, you can see that without this snowdrift, polar bears would have no place to den up here at all. So snowdrifts are critically important to model if you are a polar bear. You model, polar bears don't model. But here's, a, here's a den, the dogs can sniff the polar bears. They get excited, they dig. Then Glenn checks it out and says, yes, it's a polar bear. Um, and here is the model simulation. Um, with um, this was what was modeled with the black line, the um, red line is what was observed. And um, they actually had, to, in order to get the model to simulate the dens correctly, they actually had to correct the digital elevation model that it was not precise enough, that it was actually needed very, very precise information in how quickly um, the bank cuts down here that it, didn't work. And so they actually went out and surveyed um, to find out that they needed to correct the DEM because they weren't getting polar bear dens in the right place. And as soon as they corrected the DEM, then the model actually worked. So um, the concept of how he's doing this is um, he's basically defined the way to do this computationally effectively rather than blowing individual parcels of snow, which I've tried to run it and it crashed my computer pretty fast. Um, 
is that he defines a tabular surface. So that's, you know, if there was an, if the wind was blowing in this direction for long enough, and there was an adequate snow supply, it would fill up this area of the black line. Now, in a given year, there might not be enough snow or enough wind. And so what he's doing is he's allowing snow to accumulate up to this line preferentially um, by the amount coming in from the model. All right, so um, here again is a picture of the um, Kuparik and I'm gonna pronounce it horribly, Sagavonovitov River Basins, which are by, again, this is Prudhoe Bay, that's where all the oil is. This is the road, if you ever watch the Ice Road Truckers show, that's where they drive. Um, these are where the weather stations are and snow survey sites. And so um, you start with interpolated snow observations. So these are just the observations. Then um, he uses Micromet and snow model and snow assimilation. So now we have some transects. We've also measured snow depth some places. So we take, he takes into account the topography, he takes into account snow depth, and he updates what you would expect from just the Met data to look like a much prettier picture taking into account all of the processes we just discussed. And now here is moving to a um, much coarser grid. So now X and Y reach 10 kilometers, time step is three hours over a much larger domain. And so um, here are just um, little snowflakes showing um, over the Arctic where Glenn has been doing simulation efforts. And here's an Arctic picture of the forcing grid. Um, so um, this is where you have met data. Again, over this type of domain, you pretty much need a weather model. You're probably not gonna have station data over the Arctic at a high enough resolution to do much. And then can calculate with the model snow cover duration. And this is a 30 year average over the Arctic. Here's Alaska here. And yes, he fits in. You remember someone commented last time that people don't like to model Greenland. Um, I'm not sure why. Okay, so how do we scale from point data to larger domains? What makes sense here? And these are again, a few examples from Glenn. So um, here are, here's a picture. Um, this is from a paper by Matthew Sturm, who has been looking at working in the Arctic for quite a while, taking pictures of 50 years of change in Arctic shrub abundance. This is same basic picture. You can see in 2001, there's a lot more shrubs than there were in 1949. So remember, these little shrubs get little snowdrifts right behind them. Um, so you can think about how to model snow vegetation interactions. Again, here's the wind you have to define the shrub as having a canopy height and a stem diameter. Um, this again is, is not in the model we've been using, but if this is your domain and your process, you need something like this. So again, as you're distributing your snow model, think about where you're working and what you need to know about it. Um, here, um, here basically is a zooming out. So here's a close picture of the shrubs and the snow. And here's a picture, here's the tundra and the snow and the shrubs. So the shrubs actually get more wind drifting and enhance snow depth local to the shrubs. Um, you can then look at how, um, how the reduction in wind redistribution and blowing snow um, change due from increased vegetation heights. So you can actually look at wind redistribution to start with and then how that changes with moderate and then tall vegetation. And so you actually, you actually end up with less sublimation as you grow the vegetation because it holds onto the snow more and you get less being redistributed and sublimated away in blowing snow. So um, you actually can see that we're getting more snow in vegetated parts of the Arctic as shrubs are coming in. Um, so, you know, 
something you can actually work out the physics and model. And these are the references to the papers if anyone is interested right here. And I put a few of Glenn's papers, but not all of them um, on the, the page. Um, I'm not going to go into all the details here, but again, you you can study across spatial scales very, very fine things, right? This is this one shrub with all these different processes happening, and it actually creates patterns across the landscape that then evolve in time as more shrubs grow and expand and allow more shrubs to grow. Um, Oh, this is another um, picture looking at, um, you know, we, we mentioned when we talked about layers and temperature gradients in snowpack. So the typical Arctic snowpack has a top layer, which is a wind slab layer, and a bottom layer that's a depth pore layer, um, which are due to the temperature gradients. Um, and you can actually see that these temperature gradients across the snowpack change with um, microbes in the substrate. So again, this is not my area of expertise, but um, here's a reference if you're interested in how you can get patterns with microbes in Arctic snow. And then once you can model that fine scale feedback and put that process into your model, you can then show um, changes in what we would expect by number of days of microbial activity um, is in the subsurface in the winter with increases in shrub growth. And that um, how that is then going to um, change the number of days in the winter that the so soil surface temperature is at or above negative six degrees Celsius. Final example is the climatology of mosquito activity on the North Slope and how that affects caribou herds. And um, I'm not going to go into the details here either. Um, but again, you can look at snowdrifts, vegetation interactions, and then biological interactions. So what do all of these examples have in common? Um, you know, basically starting with just walking around and looking at things, trying to use field observations to learn the rules, making relationships between different parts of the system with a specific focus on relationships between the physical and biological systems, often also with the um, complex topography that things are working over, and then develop models that can extrapolate those rules and relationships in space and time. Um, you know, even though this is a snow modeling class, Glenn wants everyone to make sure you see the capital letters here, that everything starts with observations and with data, that, you know, modeling without walking around outside and looking at things and thinking about processes is uh, not very practical. Um, so as modelers, we want to merge our data and our models and then use the data for information and understanding, and then the models to extrapolate that information and understanding in space and time. And think about what are the appropriate spatial and temporal scales to the questions that are being asked. And uh, yes, just another plug for data and pictures of people collecting data, which particularly in the Arctic is not a trivial endeavor. Um, and so, large shout out to all the data beyond the scope of our class, <laughs> but it's out there. And uh, in your career, you've got to go look at all the data as well. <laughs> all right, the end. And if you have questions, email Glenn Liston. Uh, you can ask me. I actually know some of it, but I don't know all of it. Um, but I did want to share that because I actually think it's a really good presentation. While I switch, are there any any questions about anything? Okay. All right, so I wanted to give an example of one, you know, one modeling system. And now we're going to back up a little bit to um, think about different 
options, again, from the more modular format. Um, this is a picture that's me in the shadow, and this is the French Alps from the European Snow School um, last February. Thinking of European Snow School, I did post an announcement that they are going to study snow on sea ice in Finland this year. And if you're interested, preliminary applications are due by next week, by October 30th. Um, it's, it's a very fun experience, so I would recommend it if you have the time and ability. Okay, so um, so we just looked through um, Glenn Liston's snow model, which is distributed, right? One of the biggest choices is how, you know, how do you choose the grid cell spacing? Because you're going to put a grid cell for each place you're going to represent your snow, part, snow processes. So you have an explicit representation of space. But you have a choice. Another option is to do a lumped model, which has no explicit representation of space. So one example in hydrology of a lumped model would be the Sacramento soil moisture accounting model, where for a watershed, you basically presume your watershed is a fairly large bucket and you have water moving from one bucket to another and eventually showing up at your stream flow site at the bottom. You, you can't make a pretty map like we just looked at, but you can represent the key processes and in a place where you're observationally limited, you can often get stream flow to match better with a lumped model than a distributed model. Um, on the hydrology side, a very common distributed model is um, DHSVM, which stands for the Distributed Hydrology Soil Vegetation Model, um, developed by um, Mark Wigmoska um, who, when he was here at the University of Washington. And similar to what you saw for Glenn Liston's model, this one has a grid, and then at each grid cell, it has something very similar to what we saw with the SUMA model, which is kind of a big tree at each grid cell and um, you know, processes of the soil underneath. Other spatial organizations um, of models somewhere in between is um, the VIC model, which frequently runs at a spacing of you know, six kilometers to 12 kilometers. It's frequently run over the continental US and it uses um, something called tiling. So it basically, you know, for each one of those grid cells, it has a variable infiltration curve. That's the name of the VIC model, variable infiltration curve um, capacity. Um, and then it has for these tiles within 12 kilometers, you can imagine having a lot of different snow elevation bands, particularly in the mountains of the Western US. And so they actually define you know, different fractions of area for their larger grid cell at which they would expect there to be a different temperature, a different amount of precipitation as a function of elevation, and then let snow cover evolve separately in each of these and then weight the total and put that into the um, soil and stream flow routing. So this is somewhere in between um, lumped and distributed. All right, so this is thinking of, of the surface. And for those who read more than what I, I told you you had to in the SUMA model, you know that the SUMA model also talked quite a bit about choices of how you put together spatial variability and hydrologic connectivity within the whole model. So um, for example, the NOAA model just takes soil and then outputs from the bottom of the soil directly into outflow. The VIC model has a subsurface aquifer and lets things go from the soil to the aquifer and then out. Um, a model like PRMS, which is a lumped model with um, hydrologic response units, which I'll, is in where it says HRUs right here, um, basically models the soil separately at all the different hydrologic response units, but then dumps all of the different outflow from the soil into the same aquifer. And then DHSVM has a connected aquifer so that each aspect in the soil puts water into its local aquifer, which then can transfer water basically downhill with a gradient of a pressure gradient as the aquifer moves. Again, each one of these, this is how different elements go together. You know, similarly, you can see here with VIC, you have multiple snow elements that all 
are dumping into one soil element. Um, how will you then define those elements is another choice. Um, again, we saw probably several examples of a grid. Another example is a hydrologic response unit where you would define aspects of your grid that you think would behave similarly. For example, this one is showing a sheltered hill slope shrub environment, a relatively exposed hill slope shrub, a hill slope fir, aspen, and a riparian zone. For snow, we might also say south facing slopes, north facing slopes, uh, forested north facing slopes, and it allows you to save computational time by not explicitly resolving, you know, three or four grids that might have fairly similar processes happening at them. Um, this is, you know, when you are trying to upscale to the level of hydrology, these spatial variations of spatial heterogeneity are one of the largest differences in model choices that anybody makes. Um, again, um, their top model and VIC have subgrid probability distributions of snow water equivalent or frozen ground, but only that. Um, some models, as you saw from reading the PILPS paper, do separate energy balance calculations for snow covered and snow free areas. Similarly, some do separate snow model conductance calculations for sunlight and shaded leaves. That's also beyond the scope of what we're doing. Um, some try to come up with new flux parameterizations that work better at different spatial scales. And this is this is a problem in that um, in that we, we you know we can measure something at a point, um, but we noticed that you know for the turbulence, what was that sonic anemometer even representing on the landscape, right? It it was representing the one point where we happened to put it on the tower. And that if your whole grid cell you're modeling includes trees plus snow plus a freeway, you know, you might want something else that actually better represents an area average. Um, also, there are effective parameter values. The Richards equation is um, the physics of how water moves through a porous medium, but it is so sensitive to specific physics of the porous medium that many things operating at larger scales are using other simplified equations by upscaling this. Then what are your spatial units? Um, we talked about a grid and a hydrologic response unit. TIN, which you may also come across, is a triangular irregular network. It's basically like a grid, but the idea is that you don't need to have the same space grid cells everywhere. And with triangles, you can do that much easier than with squares. So you can have a lot of little triangles where you want a lot of variability and more large triangles where you want less. And then as I just showed on the prior one, different degrees of hydrologic connectivity. I know a number of you asked, like, is it really okay that SUMA doesn't make the snow move laterally between the snow column? Um, you know, probably depends on your application. Um, similarly, a lot of models decide whether or not to include lateral subsurface flow among the soil columns. Um, what we've talked a bit about parameterizations and model parameters, again, in our one column, as you go to distributions, different parameters and parameterizations work better with different distribution scales. So again, I'm going over this fairly quickly. Um, if you want to go into this more, you will need to spend more time. Um, here's just one example, again, from Martin's paper of the outflow that, um, you know, the 1D Richards equation, which should be the most physically based, which you think would work best, actually doesn't match runoff very well because it doesn't scale so well. We just don't know the fine scale physics well enough. Whereas a um, simplified base flow model with, um, with in the case of the second row, is lumped behavior, actually does better than Richardson's equation, and then we can get slightly even closer matching the observations by doing a distributed connected base flow. That was the example for um, the DHSDM model, was that one. All right, and with a little bit of time left, 
I wanted just to go back to um, the idea that snow heterogeneity matters. There, um, so in Glenn's presentation, he went over um, how you could use the coefficient of variation to describe how variable the snow is. And if snow is, if you're doing a lumped model over a grid, but snow is quite variable across it, you need to parameterize it in some way. So you actually have to use some way to come up with snow heterogeneity. Why does it matter to think about snow heterogeneity? Um, if he, Glenn demonstrated if you were a polar bear, it matters a lot, right? Whether you can live or not depends on whether you have a little snow drift. Um, it turns out even if you are a hydrologist trying to model stream flow, um, snow heterogeneity will result in less flow earlier in the season and more flow later in the season. So this was um, one of the earliest papers that was demonstrated by Charlie Luce working in our site we now know and love well, the Reynolds Creek watershed in Idaho. It has some snow drifts and he found that there was no way he could simulate stream flow out of this watershed without putting in these snow drifts. Um, he had to put them in in some empirical way just to get base and average snow melt, right? So um, how does this work? So this is um, one of my papers where I was simulating snow melt and diurnal cycles in Tuolumne Meadows, which was where I showed you the picture at the very beginning with the trees that have been killed by ice. And if you just model snow depth increases with elevation in a constant amount, so there's just each elevation has a constant amount of snow, um, you get the blue modeled line where the red and the pink are the observations. And so you just melt snow way too early. Now, if the only thing you change is at each elevation, instead of defining a mean constant snow depth, you just define a distribution. You say, okay, that's the mean and it has this standard deviation around it. So now each elevation has a range of snow depths and a range of melt rates. We just let snow be patchy and heterogeneous. We haven't explicitly done anything. This is just a model with elevation where we took area elevation curves for these watersheds. And by simply adding heterogeneity, you get the black, the black dashed line. And so it shifts, um, it shifts peak um, stream flow lower and gives you more stream flow later. So how does that work? Um, a way to think about it is just a really simple conceptual diagram. So here's my uniform snow depth with an average depth of D over basin area A. And here's my heterogeneous snow cover with an average depth of D basin area A, right? Where I made half of it have half as much snow and half of it have one and a half times. So melt outflow is gonna be melt rate times snow covered area. And we start melting the snow. So half one half of the snow depth melts. And here with our uniform snow, we now have 0 0.5 of the snow depth everywhere. And with our heterogene heterogeneous snow, we now have um, only half the basin area is covered with snow, but it has a snow depth of, of D that's twice as deep here, right? And so now again, we start melting. In our uniform snow, all the snow is gone. We had a lot of outflow there. Um, and our heterogeneous snow, we still have some, right? So we, we all see this outside all the time when we walk around, but even if we don't model it explicitly with this high resolution grid, we need to have some way of modeling it statistically to get more snow left late in the season or our snow model will be wrong. Um, this graph is an, a summary. This was a review paper that Martin Clark put together where um, he looked at studies done all across the Northern Hemisphere um, by people who went out and looked at the variability of snow and asked how variable it is. Um, there's Matthew and I in the Arctic tundra with magna probes measuring the variability of snow. Um, Gunter Bloschel put up a um, paper in, I posted this paper, Gunter Bloschel wrote the paper in 1999 where he said, Things you want to think about in distributing any snow model are, you know, we have a true pattern and process and variance that we are trying to represent. 
in reality, we have a measurement that we took at some kind of spacing over some kind of extent with some kind of support. And support is the, the footprint of your measurement. And then we have a model that works probably at a different spacing extent and support. And so here's just a picture of what he means by each of this. What's your spacing between your measurements? What is your extent? How far did, did you bother to make measurements? And you know, what's the footprint of each one of your measurements? And you need to think about that as you do your evaluation for a distributed model. What, what do you actually have going into your evaluation? Um, and are they at the same scale? Um, it's not trivial, and I don't have easy answers for you other than take the time to look at the original data and look at these characteristics of the original data. Okay, so um, just because I've been talking way too long, take a moment to type in the chat box, what are the primary processes, we've seen a lot already, leading to spatial variability in snow? We got topography, ground cover, canopy interception, wind, wind and topography, redistribution via wind. Hmm? <laughs> and Justin says you're all quick typers. Wind, topography, and surface vegetation. Absolutely, those were all highlighted in Glenn's talk. Um, Ones I didn't see anyone get yet are sloughing and avalanching. Um, you also see precipitation patterns, including local rain shadows. Um, I haven't had time in this class to go over orographic precipitation, but you can find very strong precipitation gradients just in snowfall over very small um, hills in topography. Also, the transitions between rain and snow will lead to quite a bit of spatial variability as well as if you're looking later in the season, variability in the melt energy, right? Radiation, shading, albigo, I think you said the vegetation, which are you know, the emerging shrubs. Thank you guys, got it. Um, so here is um, you know, Glenn Liston's log normal probability distribution um, as reprinted in Martin's review paper. And um, basically this is, um, the, just a table of typical coefficients of variation by vegetation type. Um, this is from a paper by John Pomeroy for um, boreal forests, arctic tundra, and prairies, um, where again, you get just much higher wind speeds over the tundra and the prairies than in the forest. So even though forest interception does a, quite a bit, um, you tend to get less coefficient of variability. The prairies tend to be the highest because, remember, it's divided by the mean and they have a fairly low mean most of the time. But you can actually get a log normal probability distribution of snow depth just statistically based on um, some of these measured values. And this paper has um, a summary of basically anything as of 2011 that um, Martin could find where someone had gone out and measured enough to get a coefficient of variability of snow in a spot. Um, and then with not much time left, this is, remember I showed you the picture on the very first day of uh, helicopter skiing in New Zealand. So here's the data that came out of it. They measured snow depth everywhere. Here are, um, here, so here is the difference from, this is very similar to what I just showed you with the Tuolumne study. This is for this basin in that, you know, here's the evolution of, snow across all the different elevations in that New Zealand watershed. The lumped model just basically simulates the one in the middle, right? It pretty much follows the average snowpack. But that average snowpack is gone much earlier before all of the deeper snowpacks are gone. So if you just take the average of snow that's left, you end up with uh, snow lasting quite a bit longer, which is why we see late season stream flow. Um, now, if you don't want to spatially model all of those, but just want to, um, this is what you get from um, explicitly giving a um, fine 
fine grid. So the five meter is homogeneous accumulation, the black one, but over a very, very fine grid. And then you can see that um, the other ones have um, heterogeneous accumulation over different sized grids. And in terms of late season SWE and runoff, you actually, if you have heterogeneous accumulation, you actually get more um, across all of them. It makes more difference to add heterogeneity than to just make a fine scale grid. And so even at five meters, there are some spots that are going to have deeper snow than others. Again, it pretty much matters for late season SWE. And for your process, you should think about whether that matters. Um, for the Pacific Northwest, where I live, it's all about water for salmon, and that late season SWE is the water for the salmon when they want to come up the river. Um, so it's it's actually very important up here. And um, the other example here shows that you don't need to be point specific. If you just have um, some, some variability, you, even if you have a lumped model, as long as you include that subgrid variability, you, you do OK, as long as you don't have a lump model without any statistical representation of variability. Other one, this um, Glenn also had a picture from this paper. This is a different picture. Um, spatial patterns are repeatable, and we can use that in snow modeling. This is the um, mountain of the Holy Cross in Colorado, um, where um, people said that you could make forecasts based on the day that you know the, the cross appeared on the um, mountain, and it always shows in the same spot. That's where you get the deep snow drift. And because we're almost out of time, this is again just showing three different years, snow depth across the transect, repeatable from year to year. Um, and this says, you know, there are a few years where you get something different. There are odd years, but the majority, if you have sufficient snow, wind transport, and typical storms will lead to the typical pattern. And I will skip this if you're interested. This is just another interesting paper where they try to define their grids for their model, just taking pictures with a camera and decided to classify all the aspects of their mountains by uh, labeling spots on a camera. All right, with uh, three minutes left, any questions? Comments, you can also turn on your uh, speaker. All right, well, feel free to um, send me a note in the lobby for whatever you'd want me to present Monday. And then um, you have your groups. I will I will post an update of the groups as I understand it from what you guys told me today. Jonathan, if you could tell me who managed to convince you to join their group, that would be helpful. All right, thank you.